Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Three stakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito Hey there, welcome to ATL and 29 at Peach Soup's podcast, where we look at the NBA from the starting point of Atlanta. The Hawks are finally back in Atlanta. I'm here with Glenn Willis of Peach Tree Hoops. And, uh, you know, just to get some trivial stuff out of the way after uh, going to the Hawks practice today, Glenn, should the, should the Hawks trade John Collins? Uh, well, of course, that would depend on the return, but in like 99 scenarios out of 100, I would say no. And why not? He's an awesome fit with Trey. I, I don't, I think it'd be, it'd be hard pressed to find a better fit for uh, with Trey, a guy who is, I think, like possibly, if not likely, one of the 10 best at diving to the rim and finishing plays uh, in the pick and roll, and then also. Uh, amongst bigs probably one of the 10 best pick and pop three-point shooters and you get that in both players and you're building around uh the elite pick and roll point guard in the nba and i don't know why you would want to uh break those two up uh in addition to that he's been um one of their more consistent defensive players uh this year and has grown each year defensively so um i don't see that being a solution now if you have a chance to add like a top 10 or 12 or 15 player in the league, whatever number you want to choose there, you have to think about almost everyone on your roster to make a move like that because that's what it takes to really become a contender. But apart from a situation like that, uh, that I don't, I don't think that scenario is out there today, and maybe even not going to exist this year. Um, right. I, I, I don't see the the sense in it. Your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with you. I think if you're going to build around Trey, uh, you you certainly would want somebody who's the, a role man of John's uh, caliber, but I think it's just smart to sort of play two bigs the way that the Hawks do with Capella and Collins. And I really think Collins is the one who sort of facilitates that his diverse skill set, And, you know, he's, he's an elite finisher, uh, but, you know, I guess they, in a way they have to keep him happy. Like I, it, and, and that seems weird just in the sense that I don't think he's particularly unhappy most of the time. I, I think winning cures a lot of that. And that would only come up if they're, you know, they're going through a prolonged losing thing, but you know, he, he just does a lot. And, you know, I, it's this, it wouldn't be the first time where we got to one of these podcasts and we said, well, you know, what can the Hawks do to get John the ball more often? Because that's when good things typically start to happen. And, you know, it takes some work to get that to happen. Teams want the ball to go somewhere else. And, you know, so, so that's something that they have to pursue. And, you know, he's, he's in his fifth year and this is sort of the second fewest shot attempts per game out of his career, you know, lower than every season, except for his rookie season under Bud, where he was essentially just a backup five. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure he wants a bigger role than what he has. I mean, he has the contract, so. Uh, that's in place for him but you know he's 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 a perfectionist and you know, kind of reading between the lines it felt a little bit like that story about him being frustrated with sort of taking frustration about losing and some of his post-game quotes were you know I appreciate John in the sense that I like people who try to say something in the media availabilities as opposed to people who just try to say the most bland thing and John goes out of his way to express how he feels and, and say something that means something. So when it, he loses and he tries to express that, uh, I think it comes off as disappointment, but you could say disappointment about what. And I think in John's case this weekend, even though he played two very frustrated games in Los Angeles, uh, I think it's frustration about losing mostly. Yeah, that'd be my guess too. I mean, 
all the things that I've taken in from watching him and being quote around him, the closest I've gotten to that is at summer league and get, get, you know, had a chance to kind of see uh, him play really up close. Um, you know, the way he's committed to leading on the court, uh, I, I have no doubt that a, a large part of that frustration is losses, the losses. Um but, but in addition to that, if a player of his caliber wants the opportunity to show all that he believes he can do, there's naturally going to be some some frustration there as well. Now, when we heard last year um, that there was, quote, noise in the locker room, if I could kind of summarize it that way, and that JC was one of the voices, that was when they were not winning games. And, you know, this report kind of comes out again, and, you know, um, it came from Shams, I guess I guess it was. Um, saying that there's frustration, and I think there was an, um, a reference to his role or or something like that. But I don't think there's anything to get upset about if he, in addition to being frustrated with the losses, also thinks he could be helping his team more, or and or showing more of what he's capable of doing if he got more opportunity. I don't think that's necessarily a negative thing. Uh, you know, so long as he's a guy who you know generally demonstrates that he's putting wins and losses ahead of his own you know production which is what i feel like i've observed uh throughout his time in with the hawks yeah and and i mean didn't it look like he was frustrated this weekend in los angeles like in the in the game against the lakers i think he I, i'm he always seems a little bit intimidated by lebron just like you know somebody who's who's a top you know, three player of all time or whatever LeBron is, you know, right. that's not an unfair reaction to have, but it just, he felt a little, it, a little spooked by some of the LeBron slap downs. Like it's not usually a problem for John to sort of protect the ball on his post moves, but LeBron was getting to them. LeBron as the center in a lot of cases was just kind of getting those slap downs from, from John and John just kind of shook his head and just kind of looked like he wanted to be somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, and and I should sh- share as an you should what <laughs> I, I should share. Um, what did I? What did it sound like? I said it sounded like you said a four letter word. Oh no, I should share that um, in that in that Lakers game, an observation of that game. LeBron was that's the best defensive game I've seen LeBron play probably in years. Uh, he he like he knew everything that was coming. He saw everything that was coming. When Trey would try to kind of get you know, to the middle of the paint with his dribble. LeBron was always there. When LeBron was playing at center and playing drop coverage, he was always stopped at the exact perfect depth. He was creating turnovers. He was getting deflections. He was always in the way. Um, And then when it came to, you know, John or someone else trying to kind of create a shot anywhere near the rim, you know, LeBron being a guy who looks like he, he knows the aging process that's going on, looking to kind of, make contact with the ball before it's you know above you know uh you know the offensive of a different player's head he's kind of catching contact down around you know the hip or or, or what have you our Malone was, defense there you go um <laughs> but but he was like on it defensively in that game so in addition yeah. to the the kind of the the gravitas that lebron has just to, you know through his stature and such he was also just a really uh, problematic and in the way defender in that game. And, and yeah. even if that was your average NBA player doing that, that's going to kind of generate frustration because he was uh, getting in the way of almost everything the Hawks were looking to do offensively. Now, you know, two days later when they played the Clippers, when they tried to run some stuff for him was when Trey was off and he was playing at, at the five um, and he could do absolutely nothing with Ibaka. Ibaka was really pushing him, you know, beyond the spots where he wanted to catch the ball in the post. And in the second half, in fact, Chris Gent even adjusted and pulled, um, uh, I guess, JC. I can't, he switched the order uh, uh, from the first half of Congo and JC to get uh, JC's minutes to at center to be not when Ibaka was at center because in the first half, JC could literally do nothing, uh, you know, with Ibaka, which kind of goes to me, it feeds the conversation around so many people want to quickly say, oh, the, the solution to John getting like all of the touches and being maximized offensively is just to play him at the five a whole lot more. And that's just not necessarily true. 
Um, you know, he doesn't have the length, and there are some centers like Ibaka. He's just not going to really uh, have as you know as much to work with. Um, so yeah, I mean, it it was I think a real experience and frustration versus both the Lakers and the Clippers in terms of what he had to try to kind of work through to generate even you know, a shot in the post or turn around or face up jumper like you know that he's so good with he couldn't get to that stuff at all um in, in those two games still had you know a, a generally productive road trip you know he's a good player um you know and all that sort of stuff but uh yeah those were I think two really frustrating games for him from just watching not even um accounting for his his comments Nate looked happy today, like the whatever the situation was with the Hawks and how they've been playing or whatever, like just him being out of protocol and back back in duty. Like I think that's the most he's smiled in months. It's like he had that first day of school look like, man, it's great to be. Well, I guess some people don't look at the first day of school as a great day, but he just <laughs> he just had that glow. Like, man, I miss this. Yeah. Uh, uh, or or was it? Kind of like when when mom goes away for a week and the house like you know goes to goes to heck because she's not there to kind of do her thing and keep everything on schedule working and then mom comes back and is like yeah you all appreciate me now don't you was it <laughs> was it maybe a little bit like that <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't know um, wh- what do you think of uh... The move, we don't know that this is necessarily going to stick, but uh, for the two Los Angeles games, we've seen sort of the backup guard rotation of the De- well, Carter wasn't a backup against the Clippers, but we've seen some sort of uh, DeLon Wright, Kevin Herter backup tandems at guard, and no Lou Williams, and Lou Williams did not dress for the Clipper game. But do you think that the bench offense is going to be okay in their hands? I think the bench offense will be better. Uh, we'll see if Nate changes the course <laughs> in this area, as you know, Nate is as committed to veterans as as uh, most coaches in, in the league are. I'll put I'll put it that way. Um, but I mean, for for me, it's also a factor of giving those two guys something to work with and something, um, you know, sort of a regular kind of lineup to work with uh, as well so is that going to be kind of built around a Kongwu working in the pick and roll with Herder you know Delon's not the strongest pick and roll guard in the league um you know or or you know or if that's not it what is it going to be is it going to be you know JC spending some time there you know you and I talked a little bit about how offensively potent JC and a Kongwu playing together could be what we see you know, some of that, um, if that's the case, we'll see probably Gallo entering uh, games in the first and third quarter a little earlier than he has been. Right. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see how they kind of round out the rest of that lineup because they'll need some shot making uh, there as well. Because when you look at what um, you normally try to package in your backcourt, even on the second unit, you usually get a little bit more. Uh, shooting equity than the combination uh, and of course Herder's is a, a very good shooter if not a great shooter and especially um, the growth he's had getting down into the mid-range and now getting to his left-handed layup for how many games in a row now has he, he's been because he's been showing that yeah um, but but still you know at the three and the four at a minimum you know getting some uh, uh, shooting there and at the five getting uh, someone uh, just seeing who that's going to be that, that help them uh, kind of use the uh, ball screens to kind of uh, create some space for ball handlers to work. So I, I think it's fine. I think it's the right move, um, but that's only part of the equation. The rest of the equation is kind of figuring out what the rest of that line is going to, going to be and then, then what kind of stuff they try to get into. Yeah, that's I, w- I was asking Nate today about DeLon's sort of expanded role of late, and that's one of the things he brought up is that it's been a rotating cast of characters for him over the last three, four weeks. Like, you know, he's had the the ball more as sort of a backup facilitator, but like from game to game, it's just a constant <laughs> change in who he's playing with. Uh, so I, I think Nate hopes to get him some stability soon in that role so that he's, he's used to who he's playing with. Cause you know, he's gone from playing with Gorgie to playing with Onyeka and, you know, all the different 10 day guys that were, getting punched into the rotation. Uh, 
you know, I, I obviously I think that's going to help them if they can ever get to that point. Yeah, they're, they, I mean, they're still the number two offense in the league, so it's not like the the backup uh, or the second unit offense has been kind of a, a serious drag. Um, it's, well, I would wish. I mean, you, you know, you're talking like the difference between, you know, if you just do like the the tray on tray off minutes, like the offense with Trey is, you know, if you just took those minutes, that would be like the number one offense in the NBA. And if you take the tray off numbers, they are like at a hundred points per a hundred possessions, which is, you know, OKC territory at thirty. Like that's it's a pretty wide gap. It, it is. But what I'm saying is they're still the second best offense in the in the league, you know. So that tells you that there should be enough offensive talent to spread across the first and second unit. It's just a matter of getting a second unit put together that can function better than, <laughs> like you said, at you know, 30th in the league. You know, can we get yeah. them to 20th? You know, so something around 10, I don't know what the numbers would be, like 106, 107, I guess is probably what would get you in that range. Right. Um, but a team that can produce this deep into the season, basically the midpoint of the season, the second best offensive rating in the league should um, have enough offensive talent just to, you know, create a, a functional first and second, you know, offense. Um, right. So that's more of my point. Um, e- even when they've, a lot of the losses that they've taken in say their last 10, 20 games, you know, there's been times they put up 115, 120 points in that range. Yeah. Uh, and still taking losses with well, that. That should be, you know, easily uh, enough um, to points to win a game. Um, so- I just think it exacerbates things like, and maybe we're not going to see these, these faces and maybe the, the continuity and the scheme and the unity will get better. It's just, when you get to those bench lineups and you're playing Lou and you're playing Gallo and at times you're playing Gorgie, you, you just don't have enough foot speed to be able to afford misses that turn into transition opportunities for the other team. Because, you know, we, when the take foul gets <laughs> legislated out of the league next year, you know, Gallo is going to be in trouble. Like, I don't know. There's they, hopefully now if you're playing more DeLon and more in Yekka, uh, and you get more depth with with Hunter returning that trickles down into the bench. That that's not quite an issue, but I think it's been part of the sore thumb that has been the transition defense is you know ba- bad bench offense and then just uh, you know just not enough juice with the players that have been in there to get back and, and guard stuff and not enough not enough intensity at times too. Like they're, they're, Cam should be better at transition defense, and he just doesn't take that f- the, the first three like super fire steps of, oh, sh- you know, I got to get back now. He, he kind of lopes back for a couple of steps before realizing, oh wait, this play is getting away from me. And then then he then he kind of kicks it into gear, but it's too late. And you know, when he's out there with so many other players that just don't have that juice, it just feels like a lost cause. Yeah, and I do think the Wu and Gallo. Um, that's been kind of a, a multiplying dynamic of, you know, two fifths of your lineup really don't have, um, and even in a way that's visibly worse than it was last year, yes. you know, kind of any, any tools to get back. And, and then you mix into there's some amount of a, um, not 100% Bogdanovich, who doesn't have the greatest foot speed in the world anyway. But, and you know, and Gorgie like, too, like he's, right. Yeah, he, I love Gorgie's defense, but it's not transition defense. Like he's not a end to end kind of player on offense or defense. All right. Yeah. And then, you know, so that's, I got to find something that works there. And, and, you know, if we was the one that has to kind of come out of the rotation um, so that it's Gallo and then guys who have more speeds, maybe it's a Kongwu at the five, Gallo at the four, DeLon uh, and Herder at the one and the two, and kind of figuring out the other spot. Um, you just have a, a greater opportunity to recover. And the other impact there was when you're playing, whether it's you know, Gallo and Lou, you know, kind of you know, probe that a little more. If they're getting two or three take fouls in the first four minutes of the fourth quarter, you're really putting Ooh, the first yeah. unit defense so they come back really behind the eight ball there yep. to, to not um, create easy points at the, at the free throw line. So there, there's so many different levels that this was, that this shows up, even though they're still the best in the league in terms of you know turnover rate 
Um, despite that, they're giving up league average points off turnovers and league average, you know, opponent fast break points. Um, and typically it's turnovers that feed that, right. um, you know, and so, uh, and they, they, they shoot the ball well enough on offense statistically to not necessarily feed the transition buckets for um, the other team, but it's just, you know, a number of lineups that they seem to have on the court that uh, one turnover that might give, you know, your average team an opportunity to get three guys back and hold up and, and, and stop the ball and give themselves a chance to set the defense. Uh, it just seems like, you know, I don't know, four or five times a game at, at the worst time, you know, those pick six, you know, run out scores uh, happen. And it's just, you know, it's a, a backbreaker when you're like, they often seem to be down eight points or whatever, you know, halfway through the fourth quarter, and every possession, the value of every possession is increasing, you know, by every single possession, those are the times you really can't have those things happen. And, and, and too often, uh, that's when they do happen. If it's not, you know, earlier in the game and kind of the first minute or two of the fourth and they're down 10 to whole points and just trying to, you know, have a neutral outcome until Trey gets back in the game. And before you know it, they're down 16 or whatever, when Trey gets back and it's a serious uphill climb. So, you know, there are, certainly issues on the second unit. They're having issues on the second unit. I just don't think they, I don't think that anyone should accept that they should have um, a non-functional offense just because Trey goes off the court. I think there's enough offensive talent on this team to construct a second unit that does well enough. Um, It doesn't uh, constantly dig a hole, but they just have to figure out, you know, what that looks like when both, when McDonough is out and Hunter's out, you probably almost feel forced to to put Herder into the starting lineup. He's been key uh, for the last few years, you know, helping on the second unit uh, and mm-hmm. things like that. So it's it's been, it's hard hard to sort that out. Um, but they have to sort it out if they're going to get get back on on track and start pushing up upward in the standings. Cam's numbers are bad. Really bad. And I'm I'm talking about team numbers. Yep. He had the, the Hawks in about 800 minutes are negative, have a net rating of negative 10.0 with Cam on the floor. Yep. In about 1,100 minutes with Cam off, they have a net rating of plus seven. So that's a 17 point swing from negative 10 when he's on to plus seven when he's off. And this is most notable because he's the only player in this vicinity, like no other Hawk who's sort of a regular comes close. Uh, I suppose the, the, you know, if you are looking at for some regulars who are sort of uh, semi-regular, due to injury or use or whatnot. Um, uh, you know, we talked about uh, Reddish being a 17-point swing. Some guys like TLC and Lou Williams are at about a six-point difference. Not 17, like six. Uh, if you need somebody with a little more minutes than that, with Gallo, who's played a lot with Reddish, it's about a um, four-point swing. Like, he's far and away the one in the lineups that are they're – killing the Hawks and why is that well I think part of the issue is that when he's had really good games or really good moments in games I think everyone is so eager to see that that that's what is most often remembered but I I think what's actually happening is that that's um a pretty significant minority of his minutes. There's been so many minutes where um, he just hasn't been engaged defensively. Certainly he's not alone there. So I don't, that would be unfair to kind of try to single him out on that end, a team that's, you know, performing that the way or defensively, that's an issue. Um, On offense, especially early in the season, um, just not much judgment in terms of how, how and when to attack with the ball ball sticking, um, him trying to make plays that um, really aren't there, you know, a lot of the time. 
Um, and, you know, part of that maps back to the fact that he's just, he's been hurt a lot and then hasn't gotten nearly the number of reps that you'd wish. But um, the play is really choppy uh, and inconsistent. And then, um, you know, if I'm being fully honest, I, there are times that he looks really frustrated uh, to kind of be in the situation that he's in. Right. Uh, and that impacts his play. So that that I feel like that's what I'm seeing. I'm I'm, I'm wondering um, if we took a moment to kind of figure out what that number is when he's playing with Trey, when he's not playing with Trey, um, you know, if there's some uh, part of it that is that he's kind of statistically um, penalized for playing so many minutes without Trey. Because uh, right. anybody, that, anybody that seems like who they try to separate for sure. So he's right. he's the one who plays most often without the Hawks' best player. That's true. Right, right. So that, I, I think that's a factor. But it, if I'm using quote the proverbial eye test is it, this year this year has been a struggle. And when he in those examples when he's kind of put it together, he's been such a helpful player. I I, I just wish for him and for the team that that was becoming more frequent uh than it has been and uh, so that's kind of kind of my view there yeah you know and in looking at his road trip i think it was portland where you, you know you're watching him play defense and trying to rotate and trying to recover to a player and you know to his credit i think he was out there kind of gutting it out like he'd try to stop like try to plant and stop and you see that he just couldn't on that ankle. But man, there was another game. I want I, I think it's the Laker game where, you know, he's playing defense and he, it's like, well, now would be a good time for, for him to dig. And he digs, but he doesn't really dig. Like he just kind of goes through the body motion of getting to where a digger would go. And then he just doesn't do it. Like he just doesn't stick his, you know, he's got to be more probing, more physical. Like he, I I wouldn't say he gets stuck in no man's land on a play like that because he kind of does the dig, but it's like, if you're not going to actually dig, then it's counter, you know, it's counterproductive at that point because you're not actually going to get the ball out of it. Like if you're going to go and do that dig, you got to go for the ball. Like you can't just move and leave your man and not dig because now you're just in the wrong spot and you didn't do anything to kind of pressure them or take that risk for a turnover. Like, it just feels like on a lot of plays, he's just, you know, going to the right places and making the right reads and the right rotations, but he needs to be more physical about it more. You know, he, he, it feels like he needs to foul more. Like you wouldn't normally say, Hey, uh, we, we need you to foul. We want to be in the boat. We want the other team to be in the bonus more, but it's like, you've got, he's got to take some defensive risks that might lead to a foul but they might lead to a turnover and they might make the opponent uncomfortable and it, and, it, and they just lead to, you know, you being an aggressive team and you making the kind of plays that might get you on the fast break or, or you know, get to a, a 10 0 run or something that, that ends up being the spark in a game. It's just like, he's not physical enough in, in those matchups in something like a help dig or, you know, a rotation where he kind of gets to where he's supposed to be, but doesn't really fully get the cutoff. It's like, you know, if he, he goes and he's more physical about it, you know, it will lead to more fouls and you don't want the fouls, but you want the aggressive kind of play that would show itself up in those fouls. Yeah, a, a good bit of what looks like kind of going through the motions. And, and you know, I, I think most of us, not all of us can remember moments when he's been a really disruptive defender and creating turnovers, you know, creating easy opportunities for the Hawks in transition. Um, and it you know, just reflecting in this moment, it, it seems like there was even more of that last year when he didn't play a ton uh, than there has been, you know, this year. Um, but um, while I was, uh, you know, intently listening to you there, Kevin, <laughs> want to guess you what numbers? You want to guess what Cam and Trey's net rating is for their two-man lineup? You could say no. Cam should, and you, Trey. You, you know, no. it, it's funny because <laughs> I, I don't know, but I will say this. Like, there was that week earlier in the season where Trey – or, I'm sorry, where Cam had, like, the, the career games. One was, like, 34 points and one was, like, 32 points, something like that. 
And the first one came without Trey and it was a disaster. And the second one came with Trey and it was really encouraging. Like I thought he looked great yeah. playing next to Trey. And so I, I, I'm guessing the numbers are going to be just based on that, which feels kind of anecdotal, but I think they're <laughs> going to be pretty good. Like uh, certainly better than the seven, you know, what we were talking about before, but go ahead. It's a, uh, a negative 13.4. Oh, yeah. What, what what's the total number of minutes? Three twenty-three. Ooh, yeah, not good. Yeah, not good. Oh, yeah. alas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rooting for the young man. I I hope he can um, be a part of the team, kind of you know steering themselves in the, in a better direction. But it's been a rough season in the at, 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 you know in the macro level, at the macro level um, for him. And uh, as is often the case with young players with a lot of potential, you know, they show flashes that really, um, you know, kind of whet your appetite, you know, for really wanting to see more and more and more of that. And, um, and like I said a few minutes ago, it's just, it's just not happening frequently enough uh, right now, you know? Um, so Hopefully he can figure it out. Hopefully they can figure it out. Like I said, I'm certainly rooting for uh, more of that to happen, but it's, um, you know, too often he has been kind of, quote, part of the problem on the second unit um, with kind of offense getting bogged down and, and things like that. Um, as young as he is, he, I, you know, I always want to kind of give him uh, some leeway to grow and, you know, and it is tougher for a guy like him to not be in a situation where he can be afforded opportunities to go out and make mistakes um, and learn and kind of grow through them. The Hawks' expectations now are to try to put together a pretty big number of wins on the season. There's less tolerance, you know, uh, for that. Um, but at the same time, they need him. You know, they need the best version of him. They need an improving version of him to be the best team um, that they could be. And um, that's, I think, just not on track uh, at the moment. Uh, I've, I've tried to steer you to some topics, but uh, is there anything else you want to talk about before we're done here? What do you kittens, think? Of... Kittens? <laughs> we need some kittens to uplift uh, us. I can cleanse, uh, as, as some people who follow me on Twitter say, they appreciate that I cleanse the timeline with uh, kitten content when the Hawks lose. I, I didn't make the connection there because I, I post basketball stuff. And when I have something cute, or, or the kitten we're fostering right now is Kenzo. When I have something cute to share, I share. And, and it doesn't occur to me like, oh, I, the Hawks just lost 45 minutes ago. This is going to be a bomb. <laughs> the Hawks fans all is like, no, this is a cute Kenzo pick. Um, but what did you think of the of the defense on Sunday? Uh, it was, I think, just at the basic level, it was a better defensive performance. Um, but I feel a little conflicted as to how encouraged we should feel by what we saw. But I'm just, I'm just curious what you took away there. It was a, it was a rough offensive game, uh, no doubt. But um, I thought the habits were better. Um, I thought they were more connected on defense, but I have other thoughts too. Just before I get into all my thoughts. Um, yeah, I think you've summed up mine. I mean, it was, it was, <laughs> it was better than the Laker game and it, you know, they were more cohesive and it was a better effort. I don't think they lit the world on fire, but I don't have a whole lot of general takeaways or trends. It still feels like they're, uh, it felt like they, they missed Clint some like, yeah. I'm re I'm ready for more Kongwu. I I think that you know we talked about transition defense. I think a lot of Clint's miss bunnies lead to. I think that's another problem. That's like it, transition defense adjacent. It's not the transition defense itself, but I think it's one of those things that kind of is a trigger. It's it's certainly one of the factors that makes them the worst in the NBA at that. But uh, you know you need Clint for defense, and when you don't have Clint, that's you know, you're missing a lot when you're missing him. Like, it's nice to have him in a Kong Wu for 48 minutes. Uh, and and I want to see a Kong Wu in a bigger role. And certainly we saw that. But, uh, you know, that that was a big takeaway, too, is like, if, if you think Clint is part of the problem, sure. But if, if, if you take him out, you lose a lot on defense. You do. Um, 
I, I mean, they're, they had better habits. They're more connected. Their communication was better. But they were switching one through four. Um, right. what, what I think they still call their red scheme. Um, uh, and it's not an automatic switching one through four. The, the big typically helps call whether the switch is going to happen or not. But they, it, the red scheme is typically, I think, going to result in at least about two thirds, minimum of two thirds of those uh, switches uh, to ha- um, encounters with the ball screen to result in a switch. But here's the thing that, you know, after the game, I was reflecting, I was like, the other team, the ball handlers and sort of the point of attack players were Rexy Jackson, Eric Bledsoe, um, Terrence Mann. And I think that was mostly it. You got a little bit of Amir Coffey. Um, there was no Luke Kennard. Um, there's no, obviously, no Paul George, no Kawhi Leonard. So, not a group that shouldn't and be. And they just massive. scored 28 points in a half like 60 seconds ago. They just yeah. wrapped up their half. They scored 28 points in the first half. But here's my thing you shouldn't have to switch to keep those guys in front of you. Right. 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 So that, but they did. They switched the whole game. Right. right. And, right. and, and L, you know, before LP was like, oh, he loved the red scheme. He loved the one through four switching. He loved, For sure. Play, yeah. And so, and I, it makes me wonder, are we going to see more of this? Is this going to be what they use to contain the ball? Because um, Nate will talk a ton about everyone needs to own their defensive assignment and, and you know, stay in front of their man and handle that. Uh, and all of that switching kind of um, lessens the impetus for everyone to kind of own their individual kind of defensive responsibility. So it's going to be interesting. So, yeah, they contained the ball better, um, but they had to switch against a lineups that even a bad defensive team shouldn't have to switch to contain. Um, so, I mean, habits, good habits are good habits. And the coaching part of me, the coach in me, or the coaching side of me believes like you, you accept the habits, you praise the habits when they're there, almost regardless of situation, and you just want them to stick. But at the same time, it's like it shouldn't have required, you know, one through four switching the whole game to contain the ball. That's, that's to me kind of a, a, a takeaway that makes me want to think okay, the defense was better, the execution was better, the result was better, but it just should not have been that hard. And that is, to me, make, is a reason to be concerned that as they you know, go match up with teams that throw more at you, um, it's, it's, it's going to be a struggle. So maybe they're trying to feel for kind of what the solution is, but I thought it was a good performance, but I want you to dig in even just a little bit. You can kind of see like, uh, well – Okay, I don't think that this necessarily is something that can be scaled up to being reliable uh, against other teams that that throw throw more at you. But yeah, it was it was an interesting thing to kind of process and analyze. Um, I hope their defensive play gets better, um, but we'll see. I was just curious if you saw anything differently than I did. Um, last thing I would throw out here is this whole. Uh, you you led with a question about trading uh, John Collins. You want to talk at all about uh, whether Ben Simmons would be helpful um, for what the Hawks are trying to do, or uh, do you see it differently? I mean, if the price tag is John Collins, no. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, no, I don't really want to. I mean, I just... Clint Capella can't not be traded this year. Correct. Uh, I really don't think Ben Simmons is going to solve a whole lot if you're playing Clint Capella. Like, I did just, that feels like a lose lose. I, I can't see it working. And, and it's often, not like you're building some world beater defensive team either, because there's still going to be holes that the teams can exploit apart from Simmons and Capella. So. Yep. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm just out. I, I don't think it's interesting. I think it a, gets a lot more intriguing in the off season. I just don't think there's really a way that that it works for this season that in a way that the Hawks end up pulling the trigger. Yeah, I I agree with a good bit of that. I, I, I think if there was a hypothetical where the Hawks make that move, I think they're punting on this year and they're doing it for sort of the longer term 
uh, construction uh, in a sense, because then it would take some work to evolve the roster to a point where it would be functional. Um, and I think there's going to be some Simmons rust. Like everybody has this idealized version of, of Ben Simmons in their head. If, if you're not thinking about the playoffs, most, you know, the sort of the most recent Ben Simmons moment, then I think you're kind of thinking about the apex of his career, which I think is unfair too, because he seems like he was borderline traumatized at the end of last season. And now he's had quite a bit of rust. Like I, he's not practicing with the Sixers. Like he's not getting NBA reps. Yeah. So I don't think he's ready to just step in and be Ben Simmons, whatever the best version of Ben Simmons is. Agreed. And that's one of the reasons I, I think that if, if, if they were to have to make this move, it would not be for the benefit of this year. Um, you know, why might the front office look at that and, and be have some attraction to it? Well, I mean, Ben Simmons would be easily the best player in the short role. So when Trey gets trapped, you want someone you can attack downhill four on three. Ben is an awesome passer, and he's a good ball handler, and he has the length and, and angles to kind of create all of that. So that would be uh, great. It, now, I've always enjoyed kind of watching teams react to Draymond when he's been doing that, and that comparison to them out there. But there are teams that just kind of get away from Draymond and cover up all of the passing lanes and 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 you know challenge him to make a, a shot at the rim with with a single defender, and that's sometimes been pretty workable against Draymond. And Ben's aversion to shooting free throws or shooting contested shots, even at the rim, as we saw last year, would have to be something he'd overcome to to make all that work. Um, but you know, on the other side of things, um, he would be their best. Def- I think he'd be their best defender uh, day one. Um, sure, and and address their. Uh, most significant weakness right now, which is um, point of attack defense. And so, you know, you could see some fit with Trey on offense. You could see um, him, you know, plugging a hole on defense. The question you have is how do you kind of fill your roster at the four and the five around him, kind of make that sensible? I I think he and Okongwu could be pretty functional in yeah. a way that he and Clint aren't. And so if Travis Slink is like, wow, this year is not going awesomely, let's kind of take a step back and build around Trey Simmons, Akagwu, and then fill guards like Herder and such around them. I, I think there's something to that, potentially something to that. I still don't vote for trading college for Simmons. I'm right. just, I'm just. No, I mean, that's back. the thing is like, like if there's a player on this roster that makes it work best, I think it's John. So right. like, it's just so hard. Like, like, I don't know. I just think that he's sort of an ideal fit next to Simmons, but if that's the piece that goes out, like I, right. I don't know. Like, yeah, I, 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 to- I totally agree. I totally agree with you. The commentary I was exploring on like was why might Slink have interest? And if you think about yeah. Trey, Simmons, a Kongu, and then going from there, there's something there, right? I, sure. I, I still am not super enthusiastic about the possibility of, of the team acquiring him. Um, but I, I try to kind of separate my own personal feelings to what might Travis be thinking if he is exploring this in the way that the report seemed to suggest. Now, it could be that he's expo- he, he, like a good uh, president of basketball operations, he's kind of exploring everything that's out there, right? This may not be unique, but if I kind of separate, you know, would I give up John or would I give up what other other, other package, I can at least see a, a construct with Trey Simmons, a Kongu, Herder, and other guys like Wings, like Herder and Hunter go from there. Um, that would make you at least go, could we swing this? Um, but I, I'm not in favor of... Uh, um, meeting the demand that i i believe more would ask at all <laughs> right yeah there. yep i'm with you all right I think that's a good spot to wrap up <laughs> uh a little bit of a bummer and some intriguing opportunity but yeah i don't know I, it, it does seem you know whatever the the reports are on what Maury wants always seems like, oh, really? <laughs> uh, I don't know. And that makes sure. sense. I mean, if you're going to put stuff out there, you're going to put out the moon. It's not what you're probably going to get, but 
Right. Gotta set the bar high. Yeah. Yeah, Gotta set the bar high, I suppose. The list price is high. Yeah. It's going to be an interesting few weeks between now and the trade deadline. Lots of rumors to react to and and things like that. But, hey, two games with Miami. These are pretty critical games uh, for the Hawks. So I think my focus this week will be mostly on the court. See how that goes. There we go. Well, thank you. I appreciate your time taking the time to do this with me, Glenn. My pleasure as always, Kevin. Have a good night, sir. And you. Yeah.